Iran is truly a fascinating country, and it's one that is of particular interest to political analysts because of its revolutionary regime and because of its unique foreign policy. And many international relationists uh, think and see Iran as being kind of this quintessential potential threat uh, to the United States, and so it makes it a very fascinating case to take a look at. Um, the capital of Iran is Tehran, because these are things you may or may not know, and if you take a look, Iran is uniquely situated ge uh, geographically. Uh, it borders on the west, uh, Iraq, uh, and is just across from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and on the east, it is going to border Turkmenistan and Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it's really at a crossroads of a number of Middle Eastern states, uh, and it has a unique country. Now, the problem, though, is, is that there are many, especially uh, for Westerners, there's a number of misconceptions that we have about Iran. Um, one is the issue of Islamic fundamentalism, and I'll talk about that. One is we think that they're Arab, and I'll talk about that. And one is we think about their language as being Arabic. Uh, and these are all actually prob problems. Um, Iran is not an Islamic fundamentalist state, and that's because nobody can be an Islamic fundamentalist state. Fundamentalism uh, actually refers to a version of Protestant Christianity that holds to the fundamentals of uh, what they saw being the Christian faith. And so there were actually a series of works, and, and they were collected together, and they were called the fundamentals. And those uh, Protestant Christians who accepted those then considered themselves fundamentalists, meaning they accept these basic fundamentals. But of course, uh, a Muslim is not going to be a, a Protestant Christian, and so these two words have erroneously come together. Uh, the kinds of things that you might want to think about as being a more literal understanding of Islam is going to be Islamism, right? And that's really what's going on in Iran. And if you need to start calling things by their right name if we want to understand it. Uh, the second thing is, is that although Iran is in fact in uh, the Middle East, it is not Arab. It is in fact Persian. Um, and if you were to ask somebody if they were Persian or not, I mean, excuse me, if they're Arab, they'd be look at you crazy because they would think of themselves as Persian. And as a matter of fact, Iran was even known as Persia, uh, up until uh, the world wars, and, and we'll talk about that. As a result, they don't speak Arabic. They have their own language. They speak Farsi. Now, the other thing that we have to at least understand a little bit about is we have to understand the importance of Islam in Iran. And that means we need to do just two seconds' work of background information on Islam. There are two major branches of Islam, and you might, analogous to the way there's Catholicism and Protestantism, uh, you know, there's different branches inside of these, um, but the two main are Sunni and uh, Shiite, or Shiite. Uh, and the, the, dif the big differentiation between these two is the way that they believe authority, religious authority, is passed down, right? So for the Sunnis, uh, religious authority is passed down via the choice of the community or the people. Uh, and this comes from a passage in the Quran which states, translated, quote, your people will never err, meaning that they will always select the correct religious leaders and that therefore the secession of religious authority after Muhammad should come from kind of this communal choice. Uh, the Sunni... Uh, position is actually the most widespread version of Islam uh, in the world. This is if you're gonna if you meet a Muslim, it is almost undoubtedly true that they're going to be um, Sunni. However, in Iran, only about nine percent of the population is Sunni. Uh, the other eighty-nine percent of the population, two percent is other. The other eighty-nine percent of the population is actually Shiite. And Shiite uh, have a very different view, and this is going to come to play in the way they view their political system as well. Shiites hold that the rightful religious leaders should actually be uh, heirs of the Prophet Muhammad through a specific line, through the line of Ali. And they call these rulers imams. 
Now, uh, the Imams were then the singular kind of pinnacle of uh, religious authority, and there were 12 of them. And the 12th Imam uh, dis ends up disappearing as a young boy. His historical evidence indicates that he is probably killed in a big battle, um, but the Shias believe that God hid him away, and that one day the 12th Imam will return to bring justice and peace back to the earth. And as a result, the 12th Imam is considered the hidden Imam. Now, you might ask then at this point, okay, so once you have the Imam, what do you do? Well, or once you don't have the Imam, what do you do? Well, the answer becomes is in the, in here on earth, while you're waiting for the hidden Imam to return, you follow Ayatollahs, and Ayatollahs become then the central ruler, and Ayatollahs are going to hold a significant amount of political power in Iran, and as a matter of fact, it's going to start from an Ayatollah, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and so you might say, okay, well then how do you become an Ayatollah? Because you're not through the specific line. The answer is no, you're right, it's not. It has to do with a number of haphazard things. It has to do with the number of followers you have. It has to do with adding things to the saying of uh, Shiism. It has to do with lots of little things like that. And there's no specific pattern that we can point out. And it's a bit has ha haphazard. Okay, so that's kind of the background stuff that we have to know to start thinking about and understanding uh, the country of uh, Persia. Now, <clears throat> Persia, and here is our map. Again, Iran is originally Persia, um, which is why they're going to think as being Persian. Uh, the country itself that we understand it to be is the Islamic Republic doesn't actually happen until after the Iranian Revolution, which occurs from 78 to 79, and so it ends in 79. And 79 will be the beginning and the foundation of the country that we think of today. But Iran, and before that Persia, has a much longer history that we need to take a look at to understand. I'm just going to give you kind of a brief background on this history. Modern Iran can trace uh, its <clears throat> roots back to the second millennium BCE, around the time people began migrating into the region from Central Asia. Uh, and among them, the ethnic group that we now know as of as being the Persians. And Persia uh, is going to continue to be named for the majority of the population in Iran up until 1935, uh, when, as I've already noted, the country itself was called Persia. Uh, Persia will become an empire by the 5th century BCE, and it is vast, stretching from the area of Afghanistan all the way to Greece and Egypt. And the Persian Empire is going to continue to be a cultural influence on modern-day Iran. Uh, their kings are going to be called Shahs, and the Shahs will rule through the 6th century ADE. The most dramatic transformation of Persia by outside forces occurs in the 7th century, and this is actually when Islam will be originally integrated into the area. Uh, after the death of Muhammad in 632, his followers are going to spread the faith in large part through military conquest. Uh, so that by uh, 650, Persia is going to be under Islamic control, and that new Islamic Persian Empire will last from 661 to 750. Now during this time, um, Arabic will become the state language. However, Farsi will continue to be spoken by the populace, uh, and as a result, this is going to kind of hold out here. So you're going to end up getting kind of a weird, or yeah, weird, but you're going to get a, an interesting mix between the Persian background and the Islamic background. It is also during this uh, time period in the 7th century that the Shiite split will occur and the state religion of Persia then will become Shiite. Uh, the the, Persian, the empire is going to be under constant attack, like many, uh, many empires in the region from the Mongols. And this is going to lead to a very unique defensive state development. Um, as we kind of jump forward to the 16th and 17th century, we're going to see the rise of two long-standing Persian dynasties. The Safavids uh, from 1502 to 1736 and the Qajars 
from 1794 to 1925. Um, but during these two periods, and uh, this is a kind of, and here's the really important thing, the Persian Empire, what's left of it, is going to start to get squeezed. It's not going to be a modern country uh, in the early 19s, uh, like other uh, European states. And it's going to face two modern states. To the north, it's going to face the state of Russia. And to the south, it's going to face the United Kingdom, which, for those of you who aren't familiar with history, keep in mind the United Kingdom controls India at this point, which also includes Pakistan, what is now Pakistan. And so from the south, it has the United Kingdom as a state kind of moving up in a colonial conquest, and vice versa, Russia pushing down. And the Persians are facing military and economic powers in Russia and in Britain, the likes of which they have never really seen before uh, in their history. Um, as we move into the 19th century, then, Persians are going to then think about kind of a modernization process. Uh, and the Shah is going to attempt to kind of learn from the West and modernize the state the way they see successful countries like Russia and the United Kingdom behaving. And it's going to experiment with Western-style economic and political institutions as the same time as it's really kind of hemorrhaging its sovereignty to the British and to the Russians. Unfortunately for the monarchy, this is not a very popular decision because they saw westernization as being equated with the lack of sovereignty. And so most of the population really wanted to sever ties with the western world, not in their view sell out to it. And so in 1906, religious and business leaders are going to lead a series of protests calling for limitations on the monarchy in, uh, in Iran. And it's going to result in electing an, assemb an elected assembly that's going to draw up the country's first constitution and create uh, the first legislative body, which is pronounced Majalis, right? I know it looks a little bit, so if you were going to spell that out, it would, it's, going to, it's going to be pronounced M-A-H-J-L-I-S, Majalis. Uh, and this is the first uh, legislative body to emerge. Unfortunately, like many of these do, this constitutional revolution is not going to end up living up to popular expectations. Everybody was kind of hoping for everything. And so ongoing battles between the monarchists and the constitutionalists are going to be starting to occur. At the same time, there's going to be another battle set going on between secularists uh, and members of the clergy. And so the, for the UK and Russia are going to end up having the chance to basically just divide up the country uh, into their spheres of influence and basically eliminate Persian sovereignty. By the outbreak of World War I, Persia has become entangled in the conflict as Russia, uh, Turkish, and British troops fight for support of various Persian factions that were vying for power inside of the country. Into this uh, is going to emerge uh, Raza Shah. Uh, there's going to be a military coup, uh, and he is going to rise to power rather quickly, uh, instituting a conscription and attempt to centralize military control over the state. Um, unfortunately, this modernization is going to come at the expense of democracy. And so on the eve of the Second World War, Iran would have, to, would, uh, would have to make great strides in establishing modern political institutions. But it, has, it cost them in their civic life and their democratic freedom. The Second World War is going to again draw the country into conflict. And as the United Kingdom and Russia is going to invade in 1941 to open a land corridor between the allied territories. Uh, the, uh, Reza Shah is going to be forced to abdicate and his son Mohammad Raza Pahlavi is going to rise. And during the Cold War, the U.S., the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union are all going to attempt to assert influence. And this is going to really, again, uh, influence the way that uh, Persians and now uh, and Iranians are going to view this. This leads to the White Revolution. The Modulus, which had regained some power during the monarchy, although not much, supported the nationalization of the oil industry. One big way that countries attempt 
to resist the influence of westernization is to nationalize key industries, and this is precisely uh, what happens here. Um, the nationalization is going to be supported uh, by many, but the, sh but the Shah is not going to be on, is on board with this, and this is going to provoke British anger and eventually lead to withdrawal of British technical support, which is really the only reason um, that the oil industry is, was functioning at, at this time. The United States, which is ironically going to initially be uh, sympathetic to Iran over the United Kingdom, begins to see Iran now as being potentially communist-leading nationalization as part of communism, and therefore that's something that the West has to fight during the area of the Soviet Union. So with the support of the Shah, the U.S. and the U.K. are going to move to overthrow the Prime Minister um, through what was called Operation Ajax, uh, Ajax which is going to attempt to overthrow the uh, modulus in favor of the Shah. Uh, several days of conflict is eventually going to culminate in the victory for the Shah. The Shah will once again then begin to concentrate power in his hands, and i.e. in the hands of the monarchy, at the same time as the United States will now replace Iran as the United Kingdom's most powerful strategic ally. Now, having brought things back, beginning in 1963, the Shah is going to begin a series of top-down modernization uh, that had been prompted by his father earlier. He's going to want to do a number of things that you might think of as being relatively good, things like grant land reform and privatization of state-run industry, a literacy campaign, and the ability to enfranchise women. But these are actually going to be seen as really negative things by many of the populace because it's coming from a guy who's kind of now has dictatorial power. Into this emerges Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini is going to have a number of... Now Ayatollah Khomeini uh, is going to end up, again, keep this in mind because we've talked about how we have Ayatollahs, he's going to be a strong religious uh, figure and he's going to write a very influential book called Islamic Government, The Governance of the Jurist. And in it, what he sets out uh, is a vision where a country should be ruled by religious leaders, by clerical leaders. Now, the Shah is going to exile Khomeini because he sees Khomeini as being a threat uh, to his own consolidation of power. And he's absolutely right about this. And as a matter of fact, he's going to hang out in a rock, a rock not isn't particularly friends with Iran, and they are happy to have a dissident of Iran in their borders. So Khomeini is exiled, but he's going to continue to only grow in strength as time road, uh, grows on. So his exile, if anything, only kind of enhances his ability to be this dissident voice. So on February 1st, 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini will return to Iran as the Shah flaw, uh, falls and basically flees. And this leads to the country of which you are now familiar, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the Islamic Republic of Iran is set up on some, on some key issues. It's going to be putting into practice Khomeini's vision of a revolutionary justice, a revolutionary country based on clerical rule. Uh, that comes from that book that he had written a number of years before. Now, like most revolutions, uh, especially radical revolutions, what ends up happening is you kind of get in this mindset that you want to get rid of all the reactionaries. And so one of the first things that happens in the newly constituted Islamic Republic of Iran is to kind of try to purge, uh, to purge those who had supported the Shah, who were against the revolution. Almost immediately, Iran is going to be uh, thrust into the first Gulf War, which is actually uh, the Iran-Iraq War. Iraq and Iran are going to fight a, just a horrendous conflict. And then it's then going to have to also deal with the death of its leader, Khomeini, in 1988, which is always difficult when you have this kind of singular revolutionary figure who dies. How does the institutions move on? So let's take a look at the system as it's built on Khomeini's idea of clerical rule, or, the, or basically the idea that you need to replace the sovereignty of the state, the sovereignty of man, 
uh, with the sovereignty of God is transmitted by the clergy. And so here's the thing that you always have to keep in mind as we talk about the political regime in Iran. The Iranian political system is seen as a temporary set of institutions designed to serve until the return of the true descendant, i.e. the hidden imam, of the prophet Muhammad. So all of the institutions are designed kind of in this vein. Not kind of, they are designed in this vein. So let's start with, like we normally with the Constitution, but now in the case of Iran, the Constitution is really not as big of a deal because it's subservient to the religious underpinnings of the state. So the Constitution is a product of, not surprisingly, the 1979 revolution. And really the only major change to occur with the document occurs 10 years later uh, when Khomeini is going to seek to ensure that the pr principles of the Islamic Republic remain after his death. It's a bizarre document. Uh, the preamble lays out the origins of the current regime, which is viewed as a revolt against the American conspiracy of the White Revolution. So right off the bat, you have this kind of bizarre intro. Um, and the Islamic Republic, the Constitution tells us, exists not to serve the individuals or to mediate disputes between interests, but rather to guide all people toward Allah. And therefore, Allah is considered sovereign over the Iranian People and all political acts are expected to flow from the words of Allah. One particular note here, uh, or quote from the Iranian constitution, quote, all civil, penal, financial, economic, administrative, cultural, military, political, and other laws and regulations must be based on Islamic criteria. So again, the whole regime is set up to be a set of temporary institutions that will exist long enough to get them to the return of the hidden imam, of the 12th imam. As a result, the political structure is particularly unusual in Iran, and I want you to be familiar with at least a few of the major bodies. Um, you have basically a dual executive, because you are going to have a supreme leader, and you're going to see that in the middle top row, and you're going to have a president. And both of these are executives in the Iranian system. However, the normal distinction does not apply. Instead, the dominant executive is going to be the supreme leader, a position that's originally created for, the Ayatollah, for Ayatollah Khomeini following the revolution. This is the most powerful office in Iran. The supreme leader is the most powerful office in Iran. And it ensures that a cleric is always at the helm of Iranian politics. The powers of the supreme leader are numerous. They're going to decide who may run for office. A president, who can be, who's the commander-in-chief, they appoint chief justices and the directors of radio and television and broadcasting, all kinds of things. I mean, it's, an, it's an incredible. Now, you might wonder, then, who selects the supreme leader? Well, there's a second body called the Assembly of Experts. It's a body of 86 members who are themselves theoretically popularly elected for eight-year terms. Um, and they theoretically uh, elect the supreme leader. But in, in fact, in pragmatic fact, the candidates are vetted in advance. The president um, is elected directly. They're going to have a number of power. Um, there was really a big kind of uh, pushback in 2005 with the election of President uh, Mahmoud Amin Aminajed. Um, and he's going to have a background in higher education and local government rather than theology. Uh, and there's going to be kind of some pushback between uh, Khomeini and Aminajad, but the supreme leader will maintain the most powerful office. And so as a result, the president is really, and still is, a secondary position. The Mahaj Mah Majlis, on the other hand, although it functions and does a number of things, it ends up really being also a secondary kind of body. Uh, the legislature keeps the Mahajlis, but its powers are unique because it doesn't create man-made law because you can't have law that deviates from God's will. Rather, it ha it's designed to legislate in accordance with divine law, which means that divine law can never be struck down. So it's really just trying to kind of state 
divine law in earthly terms is really what the legislature is about. It's a unicameral body uh, that has 290 members. Um, but you have to keep in mind that it exists alongside two other bodies, the Guardian Council and the Assembly of Experts. Um, the, these two additional bodies are going to have significant power checks on the modulus. The Guardian Council, for instance, is made up of 12 individuals who serve six-year terms. Six are lawyers nominated by the Chief Justice and approved by the modulus, and six are clerics specializing in religious law and appointed by the Supreme Leader. Their power is significant. They review, the Guardian Council reviews all legislation coming out of the modulus to ensure that it's incompatible with the criteria of Islam and the Constitution. If the Guardian Council and the modulus cannot come to a reconciliation, then the Expediency Council, the second body, resolves the dispute, and that, dis and that resolution can't be overturned. So basically, you kind of have two additional upper houses, an assembly of experts and a guardian of council, both of which that have significant check power on the legislature. So in countries like this, we're going to see that oftentimes power is vested outside of the legislatures and outside of the popularly elected individuals. Uh, and this is where we're going to end our very brief just introduction to Iran.